Shalom, shalom, everyone. You know, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are. Each and every one of us can be tempted. How we deal with that temptation is what determines whether or not we fall into sin. Scripture states in Yaakov chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, that Yah blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that Yah has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, Yah is tempting me. Yah is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. We'll be right back with tonight's study. Before we get into our study tonight, let's go before Abba Father in a sincere word of prayer. Father, we're thankful to you for this opportunity to come together, to study together as a family. And dear friends, we pray, Father, that you would minister to our hearts and to our minds. Help us to see, to know, and to understand your word and your truth. Father, we value the teaching of your Ruach HaKodesh, and we ask that you teach each and every one of us as our hearts are before you this night, and we pray your bitter coat as blessings on each and every one that participates here. We love you and we praise you, and all that we pray, we pray in the name of Yeshua, Mashiach. Amen. And the Mishpachah said, Amen. So we'll get right into it. Um, we'll speak, be speaking about David and Bathsheba. This is coming from Second Shemuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. And it came to be at the turn of the year, at the time sovereigns go out to battle, that Dawid sent to Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But Dawid remained at Jerusalem. And it came to be at evening time that Dawid rose up from his bed and walked about on the roof of the sovereign's house. He was the sovereign, so I guess it was his house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very good to look at. And Dawid sent and asked about the woman, and one said, is, not, is this not uh, Bathsheba, the daughter of uh, Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Was it wrong for Dawid to send for the woman? Yes, that was his first mistake. That's how sin ensnares us. Just a little bit of a temptation and a spark is made. A little attention to the spark and we have a fire. We need to avoid the sparks. Dawid sent messengers to fetch her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansing herself from her uncleanness, and uh, she returned to her house. This is difficult for us to understand, for she was cleansing herself from her uncleanness, because we don't talk like that. And uh, this was uh, translated in a way that is not easy for us to understand. The New Living Translation puts it this way. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Now, from the end of the menstrual period, when the bleeding stops, you have to wait seven more days for 
cleansing. And then you're able to go back into society and back into the congregation again. So she was un uh, considered unclean for the next seven days after her menstruation cycle was over. That would have put her at 14 days before her next cycle. Doctors say the optimal time to conceive is around 14 days before a menstrual cycle begins. So Dawid lay with her at the optimal time for her to concede. And the woman conceived and sent and informed Dawid and said, I am pregnant. When we sin, the natural reaction is to hide it so that no one will find out about it. But the Midbar, that's Numbers, chapter 32 and verse 23 tells us, be sure your sin will find you out. I've tried to hide things before that I had done and to no avail. Um, people are going to find out what you have done wrong because people are observant of everything. And especially parents, I do something wrong. Before I got home, my parents knew all about it. <laughs> but... Uh, then Dawid went, Dawid went to Yoav, or sent to Yoav. He says, send Uriah the Chittite to me. And Yoav sent Uriah to Dawid. And Uriah came to him, and Dawid asked how Yoav was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the fighting was going. And Dawid said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out from the sovereign's house, and a gift from the sovereign followed him. Now, that just means that uh, as soon as uh, as he left the house of King Dawid, palace, that Dawid said to one of his servants, he says, send this to him, the man that was just here, Uriah. And we don't know what that gift was, but it was probably wine, if I had to guess. But Uriah laid down at the door of the sovereign's house with all the servants of his master and did not go down to his house. And they informed Dawid, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house. So Dawid said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to Dawid, The ark and Yisrael and Yehuda are dwelling in booths, and my master, Yoav, and the servants of my master are encamped in the open field. And I, should I go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife, as you live and as your being lives? Let me not do this. And Dawid said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I'll let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And Dawid called him, and he ate, and he drank before him. And he made him drunk. David purposely got him drunk. And that evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his master, but he did not go down to his house. Even though Uriah was drunk, he still considered it a poor and selfish choice to go to his own house while Yoav and the army were sleeping in the open fields. That tells us that Uriah was probably a man of good character and considered others before he considered himself. Verse 14, And it came to be in the morning that Dawid wrote a letter to Yoav and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in front of the heaviest battle, and you shall turn away from him, and he shall be smitten and shall die. And it came to be as Yoav watched the city that he appointed Uriah to take the place where he knew there were brave men. 
And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of Dawid fell. And Uriah the Hittite also died. And Joab sent and reported to Dawid all the events of the battle and commanded the messenger saying, when you have finished reporting all the events of the battle to the sovereign, then it shall be, if the sovereign's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you go so near the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote of Imelech, the son of uh, Yerubasheth? Was it not a woman who threw an upper millstone on him from the wall? so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. He said that, saying that this would appease King Dawid if he was angry. And the messenger went and came and reported to Dawid all that which Joab had sent him. And the messenger said to Dawid, the men have been mighty against us and we and came out to us in the field but we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate and the archers shot from the wall at your servants and some of the sovereign's servants are dead and your servant uriah the hittite is also dead it sounds like this messenger uh, thought about the message he was given and put it in his own words to avoid Dawid asking him why they went so close to the wall. Yoav had told him he could appease Dawid by telling him Uriah the Hittite is also dead. So he just injected that in the message from the beginning. And Dawid said to the messenger, Say to Yoav, do not let this matter be evil in your eyes, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it and encourage him. And the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, and she lamented for her husband. The standard time for mourning was seven days, and I'm sure that that's what they what they did but I'm not certain because maybe I mean there was mourning for Moshe or Ahron for 30 days but that's a different situation but anyway the standard time for mourning was seven days and when her mourning was over Dawid sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son but the deed that Dawid had done was evil in the eyes of Yahweh. Dawid is one of, the, one of the greatest men in scripture period. But he also had sinned. He was also tempted. Now he overcame much better than most of us do. But there he did not. And we see the consequences lasted the rest of his life. Okay. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Then Yahweh sent Nathan the prophet to Dawid. And he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. I'm sure he was telling this also like it was an occurrence that actually happened so that he would get a response of, from uh, Dawid regarding what, this, what should be done to this man. He said the rich one had flocks and herds, very many, but the poor one had only one little ewe lamb, which he had, brought, had bought and kept alive, and it grew up with him and with his children together. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who 
refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And the wrath of Dawid burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As Yahweh lives, the man who has done this is a son of death. Also, he has to repay fourfold for the lamb because he did this deed and because he had no compassion. Then Nathan said to Dawid, You are that man. Thus said Yahweh Elohim of Israel, I anointed you sovereign over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Shaul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and Yehuda. And if that were not enough, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the word of Yahweh to do evil in his eyes? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And his wife you took to be your wife. And you have killed him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And now the sword does not turn aside from your house. Because you have despised me. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus said Yahweh. See, I am raising up evil against you from your own house and shall take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son for well, you did it in secret but i shall do this deed before all israel and before the son and dawid said to nathan i have sinned against yah and Nathan said to Dawid, Also, Yahuwah has put away your sin. You shall not die. I'm sure it's not written in the scriptures, but I'm sure that by this time, Dawid had already felt so bad in his heart for what he had done and realized he had made such a grave mistake that he probably had already been praying to Yahuwah and confessing his sin and asking for forgiveness. So that's that's what I think. But now, we don't know. Maybe Dawid was still trying to hide. However, because by this deed you have greatly scorned Yahweh, the child also who is born to you shall certainly die. And Nathan went to his house, and Yahweh smote the child that Uriah's wife had born to Dawid, and he was sick. And Dawid sought Elohim for the child. And Dawid fasted and went in and spent all night lying on the ground. So the elders of his house stood up over him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. And on the seventh day, the seventh days of laying on the floor, on the bare floor, not in a bed, not with a pillow, and no food. And on the seventh day it came to be that the child died. And the servants of Dawid were afraid to inform him that the child was dead. For they said, Look, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he would not listen to our voice. And how do we say to him that the child is dead? Then he shall do evil, or a very great thing, or a very bad thing. And Dawid saw that his servants were whispering, and Dawid perceived that the child was dead. Then Dawid said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Dawid then rose up from the ground and washed and anointed himself and changed his garments, and he went into the house of Yahuwah and bowed himself, then came to his own house and asked, and they set food before him. So he ate. Notice that before he ate, 
before he did anything, he washed so he could be presentable. And then he went to the house of Yahuwah and prayed there before he went home and tasted of food. And his servant said to him, What is this you have done? You fasted and wept because of the living child, but when the child died, you rose up and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether Yahuwah shows favor unto me, and the child shall live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Am I able to bring him back again? I am going to him, but he does not return to me. And Dawid comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her. And she bore a son, and he called his name Shelomo, Solomon. And Yahweh loved him and sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and called his name Yedadea, because of Yahuwah. Yedadea means uh, beloved of Yah, but he was not called that by that name. And of course, we know that he was called Shelomo. And Yoav fought against Rava of the children of Ammon and captured the royal city. And Yoav sent messengers to Doed and said, I have fought against Rava, Rava, and I have captured the city's water supply. And now gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and capture it, lest I capture the city and it be called after my name. You see, Yoav was very respectful to Dawid and wanted the city to be called after the name of Dawid. But the one that conquers, that's what the city is called after. And Dawid gathered all the people and went to Rabbah. Rabbah. It's not Rabbah. It's Rabbah. And fought against it and captured it. And he took their sovereign's crown from his head. And its weight was a talent of gold with precious stones. And it was put on Dawid's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city. A very great amount. The crown of uh, Dawid took from the head of the sovereign of Rabba weighed about 75 pounds. And uh, I can't imagine it was very comfortable. Rather, it was very heavy. Uh, I can imagine what my neck would feel like after wearing a crown like that for one day. <laughs> I had to go to bed. And he brought out the people who were in it and set them to the saw and to sharp instruments of iron, and to axes of iron, made them pass over to the brickworks. And so he did with all the cities of the children of Ammon, and Dawid and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Well, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this short study. I know it's only a short study, but sometimes we need short studies. But we're still able to uh, to chat with each other and fellowship and uh, enjoy each other's company tonight. So I'm grateful to each and every one of you. Appreciate you all, and I love you, and I am praying for you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. So take it away, Alan. I sing to Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El and I praise Him, Elohim of my Father. And I exalt Him. 
Yahuwah is a man of battle. Yahuwah is his name. He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. And his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble, and with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up. The floods stood like a wall, the depths became stiff in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil, my being is satisfied on them. I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you? Yahuwah, among the mighty ones, who is like you, great in Kodeshah, awesome in praises, working wonders, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them, in your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your Kodesh dwelling. Peoples heard, they trembled. Anguish gripped the inhabitants of Pelasheth. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan. Melted. Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone. Until your people pass over, O oh, Yahuwah. Until the people whom you have fought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O oh, Yahuwah, which you have made for your own dwelling, the meek dash, O oh, Yahuwah, which your hands have prepared. Yahuwah reigns forever. And ever